I'm so delighted to see so many people have stayed with us. That's fantastic. And thank you all for being here so much. Um, I'm going to ask each one of you, just as we start, to sort of go down the row and just give us the brief synopsis of the film that you have here at TIFF. And um, Philip, if you wouldn't mind starting us off. Okay, so it's um, a film called Guest of Honor by Atta McGoyan, and um, it stars David Thewlis as a food inspector, um, and it's about him and his family. Um, and you discover the secrets that he's been holding inside. Um, yeah, and it was shot in Hamilton. In many restaurants, right? Like 14 or something? Oh, probably like 20, I think, but if you count them all. And Zosha, as they said, you designed the space today. Thank you so much. Tell us about your movie. Thank you. Um, I designed Castle on the Ground. Joey was the director, and he was just here speaking on the previous panel. Um, and Jorge's here, and John, the art director. Um, the film is about two young people who live across the hall from each other, um, and they're both dealing with their own grievances and their own situations and find comfort in each other. Um, yeah, and it's set against the opioid crisis in Sudbury in 2012. Craig? Um, <clears throat> I designed The Lighthouse, um, Robert Eggers' The Lighthouse, and it has um, Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson who play two lighthouse keepers on an island with a giant phallus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I designed a movie called Ford vs. Ferrari. It's going to have its premiere here tomorrow night. It's directed by James Mangold. And it's uh, the true story about uh, uh, Carol Shelby, played by Matt Damon, and Ken Miles, played by Christian Bale and how they are sort of hired by the Ford Motor Company to do battle against Ferrari at the 1966 uh, uh, car race at Le Mans. So France, 60s cars, very exciting. Um, and I, I promise we're not just gonna keep going down the panel one by one like this, but uh, I would love to hear from all of you how you got started in production design, because I know people come at this field from many different directions. Um, Zosha, maybe you wanna? Oh having a glass of water, sorry. No, are you kidding? I'd love to go first. <laughs> that would be great. Um, I grew up in a family sort of surrounded by art and film um, and always knew I wanted to do something in the arts and something related to film or photography. Um, I decided to study radio and television arts at Ryerson University, um, which was pretty, was good, great program. Uh, fairly broad and mainly focused on directing and producing, um, some cinematography, editing. I didn't really discover too much about production design while I was in school, but then afterwards I moved down to New York for a little bit, and I, um, I worked on a film down there with Stillman Film in the props, props department um, as assistant property master, and I really enjoyed the all the details and the minutiae that goes into the filmmaking and to creating the world and giving the actors all these amazing things to interact with. So then when I moved back to Toronto, I continued working in props and set deck and then eventually um, in art direction. And when I got my first production design gig, I didn't really look back, just kept, kept doing it. So I've kind of worked through all the departments and know it all pretty well, um, yeah. Craig, is that pretty common? People start in set deck and props and things. How did you start? Me? Yes. Oh, I started, um, I was designing theater, light, sets and lights for theater, and um, was very poor. <laughs> 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 and I grew, it up, I grew up in LA, and going through university, I actually worked as a carpenter in films trying to, to get through school. And so I moved back to LA and um, never looked back. Pretty much it, Philip. Um, I was. Um, I've always been a, a, an artist, a painter, a sculptor, and um, it's like my my habit, you know, that, that I had to support myself by uh, working in film. So, uh, like many of my friends at the time, we were we would get jobs as uh, scenic painters. Um, I was a special effects technician for a number of years. I built props. 
um, all the time making my own art, which was like installation, using film, using uh, film projection in buildings, exterior performances. Um, so I continued now to still make my own uh, art and, um, and, and support it with, by working commercially in the film business. So I find that both go hand in hand and, and um, I sort of need, need them both. You know, I need to make art to feel good about myself and, uh, and the film is, uh, you know, is it, working in film as a production designer, it's, it's super creative and I get to experiment and try things I wouldn't normally be able to afford and work with teams, which I really like doing uh, the collaboration aspect of uh, filmmaking. And Francois, you're... Um, I sort of took the long road in Hollywood. Uh, I dropped out of college after a couple of years and my parents encouraged me to uh, either make a film or work on a film, it, 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 which would, they, they had the sort of the wisdom to, to say that that would give me the best, uh, the best foundation. And so I dropped out and um, worked in visual effects and for a year and then immediately decided I did not want to work in visual effects. I wanted to work in the art department. And so I started out as a graphic designer and uh, a, a concept illustrator and over many, many years worked on many, under some great production designers, um, Alex McDowell, Bo Welch, um, moving my way up slowly but surely, getting more experience working as an assistant art director, then an art director, then a supervising art director, and then finally, uh, finally, as a production designer, so just kind of like the the the, the long and steady course. <laughs> um, it's interesting, you know, as a lot of different roads can lead you here, right? There's not one path, which is really interesting to hear. Um, Zosha, your film is so, you know, I'm sure people use the words gritty, edgy. The idea is to make it look like all these places have existed forever and in fact are decaying and, and, and that you've just sort of stumbled on them by accident. So what kind of challenge is that for a production designer? Mm. Well, I guess for specifically um, with Castle on the Ground, we, we went there quite early and location scouted. I'd actually had shot in Sudbury before um, and we had something really specific in mind that we wanted to to find, and we came across this amazing building, and it was an older building, so it already had a lot of great character and grittiness to it. Um, we found two units, coincidentally, across the hall from each other, exactly as they're portrayed in the film, which was really great. Um, and we, I don't know, grittiness. <laughs> we, we tried to give the characters... Um, like space sort of to breathe within the sets. We try to create parallels between the two sets within um, the mom's bedroom and the neighbor's bedroom and sort of use similar color palettes. Um, try to create environments that felt as real as possible for the characters to interact with and give little clues and hints to their characters. Um, so for the mom, some religious trinkets for... Anna across the hall, things that were left behind from her great aunt. Um, yeah, I tried to make it feel as real as possible. Yeah. And um, Craig, your challenge with the lighthouse was a different kind, right? You sort of started from scratch, but but were really specific about period details and you know, like every drawer that somebody opens is full of like forks from that period and all the tools. And uh, uh, talk a little bit about the lengths that you go to. Um, to, to get pull all that period stuff together? Well, I mean, it starts with just a ton of research, you know. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm getting feedback. Anyway, um, the lengths we go, it, it's, I think it's the same with just about every show. You start to try to figure out what the world of that story is and who those characters are, and you build it from there with the period film or with this particular period film, the approach we took was to be true to the research as best we could. Um, and so we found, lot, we actually found quite a lot. There's, there's, a, there's a huge community of lighthouse fanatics. They, they absolutely love them. And so there's a lot of collectors that we're able to get stuff from and whatever we couldn't get, we built. Um, and um, that's what it was. I mean, you just do the research and you figure out what is, what we should be doing, do it. 
And do you feel like those objects have, can you feel the history of them when you touch you them? Like you, you do? You absolutely can. Um, I think it's very transportive to have the items from the period or, or facsimile. Um, so that's what we were trying to do. We wanted to make sure that we brought the audience into that period so that they could feel what these two gentlemen were going through. Um, and what was the thinking behind building the lighthouse rather than going to a lighthouse? And oh, you know, it's funny. It's not as if we, well, we, when we first started, Rob and I looked at hundreds of lighthouses and none of them quite did what we needed it to do. There was a couple of things that we needed. First off, either there were museums now and they were too beautiful. Um, there were some that were on islands and even though we were set on an island, um, the, you know, we wanted to put it on a spit so that we had easy access in and out with the crews because the budget wouldn't allow for us to, the logistics of actually trying to go out to a small island every day. It would have been a nightmare. Um, so we never found what we were looking for. So as we were doing prep and we were talking about it, I started doing my research and figuring out how I was going to build a 70-foot lighthouse with a 22-foot base that wasn't going to fall over in 120 mile an hour or kilometer an hour winds. So, did you build the uh, uh, the top part in the studio, or we built it? Well, it was it was it was um, on location and in the studio. So the interiors were in the studio, right. and the interior of the of the you know the staircase going up was also built in the studio. Oh wow! And then the exterior was built on on Cape Fortune. Was the exterior smaller or the same one to one, same scale? Uh, the exterior was was slightly smaller. Uh, this, well, it was it was correct for a lighthouse. The interior we wanted it to be a very cramped, claustrophobic space. So it was, and by nature, it was going to be a cramped, claustrophobic space. But we did have to cheat a little bit and open it up just a little bit, mm -hmm. and. Um, and allow for camera movement, and mainly wild walls to get the camera around it because it was so tight. Um, but yeah. Yeah, wow. Um, Philip, you get a script, and then where do you start? Is it like an idea, a color palette, an object, a photograph? Um, well, it depends who I'm working with, I suppose. But with Atom Agorian, I've been, uh, this is my 10th film with him. So I started with the first one, was The Sweet Hereafter. And uh, working with Atom is, uh, is always like a, an adventure. It starts you know, with a script that's going to change dramatically before you actually get to shoot it. So uh, you know, in this one, we were, we'd drive to Hamilton and spend the day eating in different restaurants and looking around and finding, oh, that's good. And let's, you know, we sort of pieced it together that way. And it's really great. It's really unusual. Um, way of working. Normally, you know, things have to be nailed down. But with Adam, it's, uh, it's a very loose and open uh, concept. And he's very open to, um, you know, in, in, he invites you to come up with ideas or ways of shooting something or suggesting a different location for a scene. So it's very organic. Um, and um, yeah, so it's, it, it changes. But often when you're on the journey of looking, you will find something and you go, that's the color scheme, that's the texture. And in this one, it was like, well, it was supposed to shoot in the summer, but we didn't end up shooting till the fall. So you're in parks, and the trees were just so beautiful and fall colors, and that became music and the wind in the trees that threads throughout the film, and that's sort of naturally found. We just, you know, it just happens. So you have to be open for it, I guess, to, I don't know. Right. Francois, do you have a place where you usually start? Um, where do I, I, I start with the script and, I, I start with research, but I think it's really interesting hearing everyone speak because you can really, I mean, I can totally relate to the experience. I feel, I really feel strongly that production design is a, is a craft that has common, a common approach no matter what the size of the film or the budget. We, a lot of times, you know, you'll start with, a, you'll get a call on a project not knowing anything about it. And uh, that was certainly the case in my experience with Ford versus Ferrari, I don't know anything about cars. So uh, it was kind of terrifying because I couldn't tell you what kind of Ferrari or what kind of uh, Porsche I was looking at from the 60s. And so 
the first thing that I have to do is become uh, an expert in the, the subject matter. In this case, it required a lot of research and just, just so that I understood what these cars were. Uh, and of course, then going deeper and finding out about the car, the car races themselves. Um, and then um, I've got a long-term relationship like you do with, with my director, James Mangold, and so I feed him just tons and tons and tons of research so that he can become an expert too. He's not a car guy. Um, so we pulled a lot of clips and archival footage of these different races and of these characters because uh, more importantly, this was a movie about these two characters front and center that, that we needed to become experts about and, and really start to understand what made them tick and what they were, what they were like uh, in order to, um, to add layers to the script in Jim's case and for me to help add backstory to the, um, to the scenery, which I think is a big part of our jobs, is to create the visual uh, cues that, that tell the audience what happened what's before these scenes took place. You know? And not being a car guy yourself, you have to know that this movie's gonna be super scrutinized by absolute car maniacs, right? Who are gonna know everything. So yeah. tell us about the process of getting the cars, building the cars, where did you find them? What was that all about? Well, we ended up making about 34 uh, cars for the movie. Um, the, the, the main cars are, had to be doubled um, for stunt purposes and for different units. We had a, a very large second unit shooting in Georgia for the Le Mans uh, race sequence that takes place over uh, four different locations. And they had to have their cars and uh, first unit had to have their cars in Southern California. So um, we got into contact with uh, auto manufacturers that made reproductions. When, and they, um, there was a company in Michigan that, that made uh, GT40s and some Ferraris for us, another company down in Orange County. And, and then we also worked with some of the um, picture car builders in Los Angeles as well. But it was a, it's a big deal, it was a huge effort. And then, you know, the, the, we were trying to do this movie for a number, which you can spend, the sky's the limit for cars. And so I, the, I, uh, my art department ended up hand applying rivets onto the Ferraris one by one because it was something that you, we just couldn't afford the car with the rivets. So it, you're always <laughs> adding, you're, it's, you it's know, like- You know, somebody out there is gonna say, yeah. where were the rivets, right? Yeah. Someone's gonna say, where's the rivets? So. In the art department as a production designer, you're always trying to push until the cameras roll to make it better, whether it's a lighthouse or a cafe or a, a Ferrari, you're trying to always push it just a little bit further than what you can afford. <laughs> and did you have any car disasters? Any, like, you know, the equivalent of Coppola getting on the helicopter during Arts of Darkness? We had, there were a lot of, uh, a lot of surprises. No one got hurt on the entire movie, which I'm really proud, proud of. We had a, uh, a scene where in, 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 at Road Atlanta at this high speed track where we had built the full size Dunlop Bridge and then the scene ca called for a Ferrari to be launched at 100 miles an hour uh, past camera and then land in front of uh, Ken Miles' car that he swerves out of the way and they wanted to do it practically. So special effects built a, a car catapult thing that was about 40 feet long and it launched this car as it was driving, and um, but no one, unfortunately, the car was uh, a fiberglass replica, and so when it landed, the body just kind of peeled off like a snake skin off of the car, and it didn't look, I mean, it was just like, didn't look right at all. We didn't see that coming. No, yeah. no one expected it to look that way, so that was the one thing that comes to mind. Yeah. Wow. So, okay, so in general, your work is so interesting because it has to be absolutely visible and useful for the actors to really help them be in their characters. Um, I'm sure they take a tremendous amount of the verisimilitude for their roles from the production design, yet you also have to kind of be invisible too because you don't want the production design to sort of scream, hi, I'm production design. So how do you balance that? Like how do you make sure that there's enough and not too much? Philip, do you want to start maybe? Um, I, 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 don't, I don't really know. I mean, it's, you have to look at real life and, and, uh, and get your 
cues from that. Um, I think we tend to, uh, you know, when we talk about period films, we always tend to, like, put too much in of the period film in period into the um, production design. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I tend to, uh, you know, pull things away if anything, if anything, to to create open space. Uh, I, I know that often directors, cinematographers, they want to fill it up. You know, well, there's an empty wall there. Let's put some, uh, some flowers or something. And I, I like taking things away and, and f un until that balance is achieved and, uh, and embracing empty Agreed. space. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Gone into a few disagreements with cinematographers over that. Just embracing an open space and yeah, giving them some space to breathe. Um, and striking the balance can be difficult because you want it to feel layered and lived in, but you don't want it to be taking over the scene. It's not about the set necessarily. It's generally about the characters and the story. Um, Craig, did you want to jump in on that one? I just think it's about trying to get it right. It's funny, you know, finding that balance is just about trying to figure out what's right. And, um, you know, you say, look at real life. I think that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, and as far as... Unless it's the Wicker Man, and, and <laughs> it has to look like a crazy man made out of sticks. You know? <laughs> no hiding that. This is a fucking 60-foot... Wicker man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what happens if, if you and your director um, and other department heads uh, disagree? Like if, if you are pretty clear about your vision for something and you're sure that it, what you are thinking is the right thing, have you ever had to sort of convince your director or are you always in service of the director? Um, you have discussions. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, the director gets the final say, but you try to convince people of, of your opinion. I mean, I suppose that's the best way. It's a collaborative art, and so we're working with the DPs and the and costume designer, and I mean, everybody. Um, and you want to take everybody's opinion in and sort of figure out what is going to work best. And ultimately, the director is going to help everybody make the same film. And I think that's important. You win some and you lose some. You, yeah. you do. <laughs> Is there anything that you've fought for, any, any of you, like that, that you? Well, well, I think that, uh, you know, we're, our domain a lot of times is in prep. We have unfettered access to the director for months and months and months. And so that's our time to, to, to fight for things and to, uh, to, to show the importance of the details and the research or an illustration or a drawing or a location. And, oh, look at this, the way that this rock crashes down and comes over here. This is so beautiful and unique and the, the I, I really feel like that that you have to when when the camera comes in you have to step back it's um, classically the production designer opens the set and waits you wait for you know you're there the first before anybody else and you wait for the director to show up and then you open the set and it's sort of a formality that I think is uh, is that I like it's old, old timey but it, it you're you're giving away your daughter <laughs> and you have to let the next group of artists take over and trust that process I think I think you have to in, you have to in, uh, incorporate the other departments as you go I mean uh, when I do a drawing for something I'll, I'll have to think about the lens so I can see you know what I'm going to see in the set and the light and how it's going to be lit so I'm always thinking about not really about the, the type of baseboard or the type of chair. It's more like what's the overall feeling and, um, and, and start putting myself in other people's eyes, uh, collaborating with the costume designer from the beginning so they don't show up with the same color as the wall on their shirt or something. <laughs> the disappearing the actor. Yeah. <laughs> Which can be cool too. Just that floating head going yeah, through the movie. the green screen shirt that you yeah. have to worry about. <laughs> So is money always your friend? Like, is it always better to have more money? Have you had to make do with less in a way that worked out? Or is it always just better to have the budget of your dreams? There's never enough money. Yeah. Nope. Yeah, never enough money. Um, I mean, the films that I work on, the budgets aren't huge. And I think it can create interesting opportunities to be creative and work with what you have. And sometimes less is more. Um, location scouting is super important, at least on the films that I do, because they are part of the production design. 
especially when you're not building full sets um, or you're just adding on to pre-existing locations. Um, yeah. I'm, 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 I've always been a strong believer in having um, l limited resources, actually. And even on a movie, you know, like Ford versus Ferrari, Ferrari which is a pretty big movie, uh, everything, you, we can't do it all because it would be three times the budget. And so the limitations force everyone into really thinking about what's in the frame and what's not in the frame. And that, that I think that thinking can be, is scaled down to all, all different movies. What, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say it, it helps focus everybody on the story that you wanna tell. So what's the most money you've had to spend on one piece of production design? Is there one sort of legendary thing that you're like, I have to have this? And well, I, no, I don't know if it's legendary. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 uh, on Ford versus Ferrari, I thought it was we were really fortunate to be able to do the uh, Rouge factory for one day of filming. It was one day of filming, and it was the uh, largest automobile assembly plant in the world at the time. And so we recreated um, three assembly lines filled with uh, 1964 Ford Falcons. So we bought uh, 21 cars from around the United States and then restored them to mint condition in different, uh, for a one day shoot. So that was pretty neat. Yeah. <laughs> I think that qualifies as legendary. Mine, yeah. is, mu mine is much smaller. <laughs> <laughs> I was just gonna say on the lighthouse, we had a, <clears throat> a Purnell lens. These are beautiful lenses that, that are in the top of the lighthouse. And we had a tight schedule and we hadn't even been greenlit yet and I was working with Rob just to figure out what it was and I realized that this was going to take us some time to build because we couldn't find one or we couldn't find one that was available. Um, so I went to the producers and it was a, a decent amount of money to build this, for, certainly for our budget and I came in with my model and I showed them everything and um, nobody kicked me out of the room because I talked them into starting to build that before the show was greenlit. That was the, the most difficult, I think. Well, those moment. are so iconic. When you think of a lighthouse, you kind of have to have, you a have, to have it. lens. Yeah. How much was it? 115,000 US. Do you keep it after? <laughs> <laughs> It'll be in LA for the, for the premiere. You can rent it out to other movies now. <laughs> Everyone knows where to find their lighthouse lens if they need one out there. Um, Zosha, have you ever used your own stuff? My own, what do you mean my own stuff? Like, like, you know, have you ever sort of been like, oh, uh, I need a purse, here's mine, or yeah, whatever. Oh my yeah, my gosh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all the time. Over in that lounge, we've got a side table from, <laughs> and, a, and a chair from our place. Um, so don't scratch it. No one's, <laughs> I mean, don't scratch anything ideally, but no, it's fine. Um, yeah, of, of course. I mean, again, it depends on the depends on the set, depends on the characters, if it makes sense, if it's right. Um, but yeah, absolutely, I would incorporate incorporate my own things. Although, ideally, not really reusing too many of the same things on different sets or different films. It's nice to have a fresh start on every film and find specific things for that specific film. Philip, is there a memorable thing you were able to splash out on? Well, I'm doing Star Trek Discovery right now, and uh, it's like a lot of money. I'm not allowed to talk to talk about it. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> but like spaceships can cost a lot of money, <laughs> <laughs> like more than two Adam McGoyan films, you know. Um, so yeah, you could actually afford to send one into space, probably. <laughs> um, do you, do you guys have like a trick in your production design sort of toolkit? Is there a thing that you, you go to time and time again or a thing that always works for you? Um, I know that's kind of a vague question, but uh, is there something that you could recommend to like aspiring production designers that would be a useful thing to have or know about? Uh, here's, uh, we, there, there are a lot of little tricks, a lot of little tricks. Um, I always try to uh, in, encourage people myself and people to read, the, when reading the script, to ignore the slug lines a little bit and, and just really uh, focus on the, the situations and the dialogue because I think that the really interesting things have happened when 
when um, the location has been, when they've been able to convince the director to change the location to enhance the, the narrative uh, intent of the scene, you know? So I think that's always a good tr like little trick early on is to ignore the slug line. Anybody else? Have any secrets? Not like a specific tool or something like that. But Wear just clean socks, constantly. too, every day. <laughs> Except for working socks. I'm just constantly reading, looking at photography, staying stimulated, and, you know, keeping your imagination going, going to museums, just trying to, I don't know, um, have constant inspiration so that on every film you have new ideas and are always bringing something, something new to the project. Um, for me, I, I, like to, um, I like to encourage people to draw. Um, if you can draw on a piece of paper um, and show somebody who is not necessarily that visual what you mean, what you're trying to say, it's worth a thousand words. Cliche, but it's really important. Um, and I think people, um, as we do more and more drawing on computer, uh, don't know or forget or, or don't practice the actual drawing with a pencil and paper. So that's, that's a big thing for me. I also like to, when it comes to musicians in movies, because I'm a musician as well, I really try to like make sure you get a good instrument and encourage them to have a coach, the actors, so they can look like they know what they look like they're playing the instrument. It's a pet peeve of mine. Right, when you see somebody, cool. yeah. Like, I have that pet peeve about journalists in movies too. It's like, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Um, so y all of you have worked you know, collaborated with directors more than once. Like, you're, you, you become sort of a rep repertoire company sometimes with some of your directors. What's the advantage for you as production designers to have directors that you work with over and over again? Um, well, for me, it's, it's, it's... There's so many. Honestly, there's just so many. You, not only the fact that you feel like you have a family that you're working with that you've known for a while, but you have a shorthand with the director in terms of what their expectations are and just the vocabulary and how you're going to approach things, um, what, they're, what they need to do their job, what you need to show them. All of those things you rediscover every time you have a new director. You have to sort of figure those out. And every person, whether it's a director or anybody, you always have to figure out the best way to communicate with them. And if it's a director you've worked with before, it just is that much easier. Plus, like in my case, Rob Eggers is fantastic and he's, and he's really nice. <laughs> Fun to be with. It's actually, it's really hard working with a new director because you're coming in oftentimes really early at the same time of, as a producer, sometimes before a producer. And then part of your job is to, is to see what the director sees. So you're trying to... Um, create the imagery or try to get inside the head of, of, of the director and see things how he sees or he, she sees something and then expand on that but first you have but and so if you have a long time relationship with a director it's easier to get to that point so that you can move beyond it and, and then start to have conversations about how that can change or what else it could, it could be um I've, with James Mangold, I've done five projects with him, and three have been actually made. And so it's, um, he's got an office that's kind of like a, a house with a couch and a TV, and it, it really does, you, you mentioned the word family, and um, it does feel like family, like it feels very comfortable, and you're not trying to prove yourself or prove that you can do a good job. There's a comfort level there, and it, it, it makes it more fun, yeah, yeah. for sure. You might already have similar sensibilities. You've already worked together before. You know how to do it. It's sort of like jumping the queue. It gives you a head start. Like you were saying, you're kind of starting deeper on. You're not having to go through all the formalities of getting to know each other and figuring each other out. You're already that much further. Yeah, I think, so. and, and it's interesting to compare, you know, film with TV series where you have two directors at the same time and... If you don't get along with the director, then it's over in 10 days. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a constantly learning thing. So I think, I mean, I do like working with the same directors, but I also like, uh, it, you know, of course, working with new ones and finding and challenging yourself. You've all designed 
she films in so many different eras, sizes, worlds. Um, do you, do you think you have more fun designing for a world that existed, a world you get to make up from scratch? Is one better than the other? It's all. Fun. I think it's all fun. I think we have the best job in the world, quite frankly, because um, I don't know of another job where y you get to learn so much. Uh, you mentioned not knowing anything about lighthouses. Yeah. I didn't know anything about cars, and the next movie, you know, is could is probably going to be completely different. You're working on a Star Trek movie, which sounds a little different than than the last one, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so just yeah. the first, you know, the the first time you show up at work, and and um, I love. I think it's really interesting. Uh, how fear can be a mo motivator. You're like, how in the hell we're going to do this? This is like crazy. You know, and and uh, but it, when you feel that anxiety early on in a production, it means you're going to learn a lot. Yeah. And um, I think that's what makes it really unique as a as a as a craft. Yeah, you do, you, lot of, you do a lot of intense research about a certain period. So like I know a lot about you know the years. Armenia between 1915 and 1919, <laughs> but after that and before that, not much. <laughs> Don't ask me that Armenia question. Ask me a different one. Yeah, um, and I, I know that we have to sort of be agnostic in terms of the platform. You know, if it's film or television, or do, but do any of you worry for the future of film? Do you have a particular fondness for film and 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 a, a you know a fear about what might be happening to independent film, or or is it all just you know, one thing leads to another and you hope for the best. That's a really interesting question um, because things are changing very quickly, rapidly right now. But I think, I mean, I'm, I have mixed emotions because on one hand, there are so many interesting projects that have found uh, homes that, uh, in streaming and what have you, and that that are really exciting and some of the best uh, films that I've seen in the last few years have been streaming. I mean, just amazing, amazing things. The, like the traditional theatrical experience is, is getting trickier for certain kinds of movies to be made. Um, and there are less slots, I think, in the year for, it's, it's, it's like a more of a high stakes gamble. But uh, that, that's probably, that's a little sad to see less, less of those kinds of films being made. But, it, but then it's balanced out by, by other kinds of, um, um, of films being made and having um, more, more, more access to d uh, distribution and to, um, to funding. So I'm, I can see both sides. Yeah. Yeah, I think people are going to continue making exciting films. And every year, even this year at TIFF, there's so many amazing films to see. And maybe more people are going into the miniseries, which is also exciting. But I don't, I don't think it's going away anytime soon. Are there trends in production design as there are in other elements of film? Like, are there things like uh, everybody's doing this now? Um, or CGI, is that changing everything for all of you? Like, what are you, what are you noticing that's happening right now? Um, I, I, I've been noticing a lot with uh, virtual reality as a production design tool. Um, it's the technology is getting more uh, easy, easier and more accessible, and you can get off-the-shelf VR software and hardware where you can put a headset on a director, and then they can feel like they're in the space. I think that's really exciting. I'm, I've been seeing that in the last, uh, and it's not just the giant big movies; it's actually um, smaller projects too, where you can have one person with a computer bring the 3D set in and, and, and experience it in, in, in a very intimate way. We did that on the lighthouse. There you go. Can you elaborate on that a little? How did you use it? Well, you know, it's funny because we weren't planning to. I wasn't planning to. And um, my uh, art department coordinator was a young man he, who came in who had this whole system and he, was, he had been working on a, little, a new program and asked me if he could set it up one day. And he set it up and I put on the the mask and was blown away. Mm -hmm. And of course, took complete credit for it as the director came into the room. <laughs> Not really. I'm finding in, t in TV series, um, when you work with many directors, you can actually just put the director in the virtual reality room and they can go visit the sets. 
that you've already built that are standing there and they can sort of plan their shots and do all the shot lists and you can just leave them in there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, we lost the key to that room. The director's still inside. I mean, what we've always tried to do is, is try to uh, show what something's going to be before it is, right? So um, classically, it's a simple white foam model, which I'm a huge fan of. I love little white foam models that are you know, quarter inch or, or half inch uh, white foam models because you can light them, you can get, you, and it kind of triggers something in your inner child, I think, which is inter interesting. And, but but uh, VR, I think, is just an extension of that. And there's other visualization tools with 3D design and um, um, virtual production tools that are Have creeping you used in. The, um, the AR wall down in LA? No, tell me. Tell me more. I don't know much about we we they're researching one and it's basically it's like a giant television and you stand in the actors stand in front of it and it plays live a three D model of a set that you've built, designed, dressed, lit, and it's behind them all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I think that's gonna be changing very, very rapidly now because a lot of these tool sets are are are, are some of them are free. And uh, there's a really wonderful 3D program that we're using a lot on the, on the current show that's free, totally open source. Mm -hmm. And um, we, uh, we've got a, another young, yeah. wonderful nerd in the art department who's got a drone, right. and it's the most incredible thing because you can go up with a drone and you can do photogrammetry yeah. uh, for using off-the-shelf free software or almost free software, and then you have a a photo real 3D model that, that you can plunk your set on top of. And that's, the barriers to entry are, are uh, disappearing in a very exciting way. Wow. Okay, here's your chance to be heroes. It's something happened on the movie and the production designer saves the day. Do you have an experience like that where you get a chance to blow your own horn here that you might not, no one else might ever know this happened, but you know it happened. Do any of you have a story like that? I was uh, working on a little movie called Cottage Country, and um, and we it was we lived for two months on a lake. So I had my little motorboat, and uh, the sun was going down. They were trying to get a shot um, of the two of the two actors canoeing, and the sun was going down, and they went back to one. So they towed the canoe fast across the lake to go back to the beginning and do a take two. At that point, the canoe flipped over and sank. So me and my art director uh, went and got it and dove in and pulled up the canoe. Wow. And to a loud cheer of applause and an applause. <laughs> you are actual heroes in that situation. <laughs> um, well, generally we try to pretend like we don't have those moments, <laughs> um, even though they happen every day. But I, I do have one to tell you. That, um, uh, Kevin, my scenic artist, is actually the hero, not myself. We were doing, uh, when, we, when we did the lighthouse, we weren't able to use seagulls. We weren't able to have a trained seagull because apparently, which we didn't know, they're illegal to train. <laughs> um, and so there was none in North America and even in Europe they're illegal to train, but there was a gentleman in London who had five seagulls who have been grandfathered in because they were already trained when the law changed. <laughs> who knew? Um, so we were doing, but you know, so all the seagull work with the actual seagull we were going to shoot later. We shot it in London, um, you know, with little bits of set pieces, and it would all be comped in later. <clears throat> and one of the pieces for the very end of the show was this on this large rock. Uh, the last shot of the show. I won't say much more about it. Um, but we needed this rock, and we had done a cast of it in Nova Scotia, and we had already built the rock, because uh, we shot that little piece also in Nova Scotia. And we needed that in London, so we put it on a ship, and it was supposed to be there, and we flew in, and I got there, and I found out that the ship had arrived, and the crane in Liverpool had broken, and so there were 60 containers that didn't come off the ship, and it was on its way to Germany. <laughs> and um, so we were like, okay, well, let's send the mold. 
and we'll just remold it because we've got two days until we're going to shoot this. Um, and all the cargo flights were full. So I called Kevin, and he cut the mold into three pieces, put them in hockey bags, got on a plane, <laughs> flew there overnight, and helped put it all back together. So Kevin was the hero, but wow. yeah. That's an amazing story. Um, what is a movie that you watch again and again for the production design? Like, what can you recommend to the audience to be like, if you want to see some really exquisite production design, watch, aside from all of your own movies, of course. But is there one that you turn to again and again, or one that really inspired you somewhere along the line? Well, you can just go right down the... I like uh, Jacques Tati films, uh, Playtime. I was about to say that. Were you? Playtime, that's so funny. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's, what, about, what about it do you love? Well, it's just so iconic and and um, and colorful and 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 playful and simple and and really beautifully a lot of s symmetry. Um, yeah, that and I don't know. It's it, really an incredible movie. You should ev yeah. absolutely seek that out. It's really incredible. It's on Blu-ray on Criterion, I think. Tarkovsky's The Sacrifice. Hmm. Um, Two thousand one. <laughs> Zosha, do you have any that you? Um, lots. Uh, last year, there were so many beautifully designed films. Uh, a bunch that, that I saw at TIFF. One, of course, Roma. All those sets that they recreated based on, based on his childhood were all incredible. Uh, Climax, the production design of that was so fun. Jean Rabas, he did an incredible job and that was all beautiful sets that, that he designed and was all integrated with the lighting and just so stylized and so so much fun, um, yeah. There's so many, I can't, um, my mind is swimming. I mean, you say Tarkovsky, I think Stalker as well. I mean, you think of, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. I think I'm gonna watch these guys' films, and that will be my next inspiration. Um, again, yeah, so I, I really love the work of uh, Dean Tavalaris, uh, big fan Richard of his work, he, uh, Richard Silbert. Silbert Chinatown, of course, um, and Dean Tavalaris with Godfather One and Two, and um, and Apocalypse Now, those sort of amazing '70s filmmakers for sure. Um, that was my childhood. <laughs> and I'd love to keep you guys all here all day, but um, we're running out of time, so I'm just going to ask you this one last question, which is: Do you have on your bucket list a world that you'd love to design, like something that you would just go crazy over getting the chance to? build or create? We'll go this way. Putting you on the spot. I mean, I don't know if there's any one, uh, I mean, I'm always interested in something that I haven't done before. If it's something new that I haven't done before, uh, maybe in Iceland or something, cool, somewhere neat, <laughs> or the Faroe Islands, you know, or I, I think the location is a big part of it. Um, uh, I don't know, the Russian Revolution or something. I, I <laughs> Craig? Yeah, I think it's really about um, having the opportunity to work on a great story. I mean, this is, if it's a great script, then there's going to be a lot of other opportunities. Having said that, um, I'm hoping to be going to Iceland next, and I'm <laughs> really excited about it. <laughs> and, um, I like period films. I, I do. Um, I like Is there a period that you're really in You know, it's really, it's really about the opportunity to, you know, with a contemporary film, which can be great, and I have nothing, there's nothing against that at all. I'm not suggesting that I wouldn't want to do one at all. Um, but just that little bit of separation from what is today, and where you get to see the world that sort of brought us to where we are, um, and that whole journey, and, and plus just the, you know, how interesting it is to do that study. I like history, so if you like history, it, it gives you an opportunity to get paid to like dive deep into uh, something you don't know about. And you're right, it reminds us of stuff. It evokes all, all kinds of yeah. the history of our humanity, really, mm -hmm. yeah. I think it, there's something, I like contemporary films, don't get me wrong, I love them. But there's something about doing something either in the future or in the past that gives you an opportunity to describe what's happening to us here and now um, that I find exciting. Yeah. yeah, that's smart, yeah. 
Zosha, a dream, dreamscape? <laughs> Depends on the film, of course, get the script. Um, but I would, I'd love to do something set in the set in the seventies, um, like the music, the design, jumping into that, getting to do research. Yeah, the lighting, the art. That would be that would be so fun. We do a Studio Fifty Four film, something like that. We just watched Seaberg last night. Some of those interiors are so incredible. Yeah. Um, in my research for Star Trek, I've been looking at a lot of visions of the future from the fifties, and I'd like to do a film set like framed like that, a vision of the future from the 50s. In the 50s. Yeah, as if the film was made in the 50s. That's cool. Are you geeking out on the set of Star Trek? Like, is it a crazy dream to be? Um, not really. <laughs> <laughs> this is not being recorded, is it? <laughs> Production designers are honest people. We'll just um, thank you. No, I'm all. having a good time, but, I, good but, time. It's, uh, but I'm not a, a Trekkie. No, but I like yet. that. I like that extra layer that you say of imagining it, like imagining the future from the past, yeah. is very yeah. That allows for a lot of mind bending. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much for being here. It was really fascinating. Thank, thank you, you all for sticking around. Thank you.